Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Food Security Community Call for July. Um, I am Anne-Marie Hart Bookbinder, the Food Security Programs Manager, and we are joined by a few other members of the Food Council staff today, including Heather Bruskin, Michelle Caruso, Elizabeth Tuin, and our um, newest uh, Food Council staff member, Danielle Wogu, our new AmeriCorps VISTA, who joined us last week. Danielle just graduated from Case Western University with a major in medical anthropology and minors in biology and chemistry, and we are thrilled to have her on board and helping with our food security work. Um, and I'm sure many of you will get a chance to meet and work with Danielle over the next year. So please join me in welcoming her today. Today, we are going to discuss the county's childhood hunger initiative and how you can contribute to this effort. We'll hear from Maryland Market Money about resources they have available to promote this important food assistance benefit at local farmers markets. And finally, we will be joined by County Executive Mark Elrich uh, for a community town hall meeting to discuss the state of food security in our county. Um, I would like to take a few minutes because we, we have a little bit of time here at the start um, to allow any new attendees to introduce themselves. We always love saying hello to everyone, but unfortunately we don't always have the time um, to do that uh, with everyone attending the meeting. So if you are new to our group or have never had a chance in recent times to say hello, um, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, you're also welcome to obviously do so in the chat, but we'd love to be able to put a name to a face. Rona, I see your hand. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted. Uh, no, I wasn't raising my hand, but oh, sorry. hello everyone. <laughs> Yes, I was. I was trying to get my screen wider, but um, I'm here and I'm willing and waiting to see what I can do to help. Thanks so much, Rhonda Bello. Um, and I'm sorry, can you just say your organization, please? I'm with Holy Mountain International Ministries Outreach, and we do outreach um, all over. We are a church, but we we do everything we can for the communities we and we've just been blessed to have another location in Charles County. So we have Montgomery County, we have Peachy County, and then Charles County. Great. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rhonda. Um, okay. And I think I also saw apologies for the confusion with names. I think I saw also Rona Rice was raising her hand. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Rona, you're muted. Okay, we will try to come back to Rona. I think I also saw um, Paolo raising his hand. Hello, my name is Paolo Sion. Um, I'm not new to the calls, but I, I, I see a lot of new faces. So just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Paolo Sion from the Share Food Network. I'm the outreach coordinator here and I've been part of the calls for the past two years. And um, we've been um, establishing quite a, quite a uh, good partner partnerships to do with through these calls so i'm very we're very grateful to be part of the montgomery county uh, food, food council great so thanks we're happy to have you here i'm just going to take a quick check and see if i see any other hands up i do not um all right, so we will keep moving on, but again, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. And thanks again so much for joining us today. So I'd like to move us to the presentation portion of our call. I'm gonna share the agenda in just a moment. Um, I'm hoping that many of you have been seeing the information we have been sharing about the county's childhood hunger initiative. Um, and thanks to those who have already enthusiastically responded that they would like to contribute to this process. Um, but we're gonna share a short briefing with that today. Um, and I do apologize in advance. I appreciate you all hanging in with me. Um, I did just get, I'm, I'm recovering from COVID. So I'm still a little 
coarse and, and raspy here, so um, might need to take a few water breaks as we go along, um, but hopefully you will be able to understand me just fine. So I am going to share my screen and we can get started with our presentation. Okay, so I'm going to share some information today on the strategic plan to address childhood hunger, um, the vision of this plan, the process, and the timeline that we are working on. So just to give you a sense of the history and some background, um, what does childhood hunger look like today in Montgomery County? Of all households with children in Montgomery County, 46% experienced food insecurity at some point in 2021, compared to only 21% of households in Montgomery County without children experiencing the same. Over 60,000 children were enrolled in free and reduced meals in Montgomery County Public Schools during school year 2021 to 2022. More than 32,000 children participate in SNAP, and more than 18,000 infants and children up to the age of five participate in WIC. Where we're coming at it from the policy and resource uh, landscape on the local um, front, obviously, we've been working on the food security plan since 2017, um, and that did recognize children as a particularly vulnerable group in the county for being at risk for experiencing food insecurity. We have a number of municipal and philanthropic partnerships, such as Food for Montgomery, um, working on these issues. We have had a very strong um, United COVID response network during this time to address hunger. And obviously um, coming onto the scene soon will be the Office of Food System Resilience, um, which will play a role in this program and which Heather Bruskin will give an update on um, in just a little bit. On the state level, um, the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council has been meeting on this issue and, and ch uh, children are obviously a, a focus group for them as well. At the regional level, the, um, excuse me, the Metropolitan Washington Air, uh, Council of Governments Farm Committee, and in the um, federal area, um, you know, there's been lots of investment of ARPA funds, the child tax credit, universal meals, um, all to work on addressing this issue. So the plan to address childhood hunger will include um, reviewing unique food access barriers, reviewing the current landscape of childhood hunger, and then focusing on strategies to address childhood hunger. That will look at funding, strengthening existing programs, creating new programs, and policy. Um, the Montgomery County Food Council will act as the project manager for the creation of the strategic plan to address childhood hunger, including the responsibility for hiring and oversight of additional consultants and overall project coordination to include financial administration, community engagement, and network management. And obviously this was, um, we were asked by the um, Montgomery County Council President Albanaz um, to act as the project manager on this project. This plan will identify food access barriers and strategies to reduce food insecurity across all childhood age groups in the county, incorporating the feedback and insight of stakeholders, subject matter experts, and local residents. The plan will outline the current policy, investment, and programmatic landscape related to childhood hunger in Montgomery County, accompanied by legislative funding and program expansion and creation of recommendations and their associated estimated budget impact and the metrics for success. So here is what we've completed so far um, in the various uh, timeframes since we started kicking off this work. So in March and April, um, the Food Council researched models from other jurisdictions, identified key partners, identified county government staff participants and leaders, resources and levels of support drafted a consultant scope of work and recruited and selected a consultant, who I will tell you is a, um, a longtime friend of ours, Chris Webster from the Food Security Task Force, um, will be working with us as a consultant in this role. 
um, we finalized the strategy framework and outline and drafted stakeholder leadership and engagement process. Uh, in May and June, we were busy recruiting partners, publicly announcing the initiative. Um, for those of you who may have been able to go um, last week uh, to the um, council's announcement, um, collecting baseline data and assessing the landscape. And then in July and August, we will start with public convenings, our foundational research, developing recommendations, um, conducting our stakeholder engagement and drafting content. And the initial draft of the introductory chapter will be completed. And finally, we will start with feedback loops, so listening sessions and administering surveys, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. And then in terms of what's to come, um, in late August through mid-September, the recommendations from um, this project will be refined based on feedback. There will be peer review of initial drafts, a community engagement gap analysis. Um, from there, we'll move into final drafting and review, um, engaging a graphic designer to lay out this information, and then preparing communications materials, preparing for a launch event, and um, hoping to have the public launch of this plan in December, 2022. So to talk now a little bit about um, the process, this plan will seek input from stakeholders and subject matter experts, residents, policymakers, and local government. And our team will take that input and the plan will organize strategies by categories um, and chapters that will include school-based strategies, benefit program-centered approaches, early childhood, out-of-school strategies, emergency food access and community food distribution, and healthcare-focused strategies. Each chapter should follow the same format with an overview of the current policy, funding, and programmatic landscape followed by policy and programmatic strategies to address childhood hunger in this area, as well as an associate, as, excuse me, as well as associated estimated budget and metrics for measuring impact. Policy recommendations should focus on county-based strategies, though issues and advocacy strategies at the state and federal level should also be identified. The content for each of these chapters will be informed by discussions of a strategic brain, brainstorming group focusing on each individual issue. Each group will meet three times with about three weeks in between meetings. The sessions will build on each other and those who were not able to attend a meeting will be able to contribute an idea to that meeting's discussion during the notes review occurring between meetings. So session one for each group will focus on defining the scope and scale of the problem discussing the current landscape and identifying key challenges. The second session will involve brainstorming strategies and discussing how to measure success. And the third and final session will be to refine strategies and to formulate recommendations. And this is how our stakeholders and subject matter experts and policymakers will engage in the process. Just to give you a sense of that first session, um, it will seek to define the issues and challenges and carry out a SWOT analysis of the current landscape, which will include identifying available data, determining measurements of success, identifying key people and organizations, funding issues, policies and programs, and discussing what is and is not working. And as I mentioned earlier, um, each of those groups will, um, will inform the content uh, for that issues chapter in the report. I'm oh, sorry, there's my screen that didn't pop up. Resident engagement will include a two-pronged approach of listening sessions and a survey. The survey will be administered online in English and Spanish with a goal of 500 respondents. Three, um, Different listening sessions will be hosted with 10 people each at a minimum and compensation will be provided to participants. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Sorry, I'm trying to stop sharing my screen and it's, oh, there we go.
Okay, great. Um, yes, Heather, sorry, that was gonna be my, my last thing. Um, if you have not already signed up to contribute to this work, please do. Um, I'm going to include the link in the chat in just a moment. And we hope that you will join us in this process. And I'm sorry, if anyone can check the chat for me, if there were any questions that came in while I was speaking. No, okay, all right. So as I um, start loading that up though, I did want to look for our next speaker, um, Christina. Oh, I see her right there. Great, front and center. Christina, <laughs> well, I am going. Oh, Emory, oh, I just want to, I don't have a question, but before our next speaker, I just want to thank the Food Council for laying the groundwork and thinking so comprehensively. Um, I, I've been fortunate to see this uh, slideshow a couple times now, and every time I see something uh, new, especially, not new, but that grabs me. And um, so, uh, for instance, the pathways, I think that's a great approach. So I really just appreciate the Food Council's uh, work on this, and I know that uh, several of us at Mana Food Center are are eager to participate and and follow your lead. And glad to hear that Chris Webster is part of the team. He's going to be a great addition. That was the new thing I learned today. Well, I am glad to hear that I was able to contribute some new fact of information um, because I know Heather has probably been leading this conversation with you before. So glad that I could add something new to that. Um, any other comments before we move on? And, and again, Jackie, thank you for, for Mana's willingness to um, help out and contribute to this process. It's, it's really great to have you um, and all of your staff. All right, um, Christina, I just made you a co-host, but I am gonna turn things over now um, to, oh, sorry, my screen is hitting various things. Okay, I am gonna turn things over to Christina um, Berthelow. She is the Maryland Market Money External Relations and Develop Coordinator for the Southern, oh, <laughs> Southern Maryland Agricultural Development Con uh, Commission. And she's here to share some resources with us today about Maryland market money. So thank you so much, Christina, for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me again. Christina Berthelot, um, I'm new with SMAT. I'm, I mean, I say I'm new, I've been here for a year. Um, still feel very new because um, I'm new to Maryland. Um, but a lot of you probably know about Maryland market money, but we have some exciting news this, um, this, this market season, this fiscal year. And um, I'm just here to share with you and also um, to offer some resources that we have as of recently. So um, let's see, just diving into what it is in case folks don't know, um, Maryland Market Money is a, a statewide food access program that feeds Marylanders and supports farmers simultaneously. We remove economic barriers for Maryland, Marylanders experiencing food insecurity by providing a dollar for dollar match for purchases made um, with federal nutrition benefits at participating farmers markets also including farm, farm stands and CSAs this year. This year is the first year that we've been able to offer Maryland market money for farm stands and CSAs. We don't have too, too many yet, but it's growing. We're helping, um, we're helping get farm, farms, uh, direct marketing farmers online to be able to take SNAP directly. And then um, we'll be able to, to make those, um, this program more uh, wide stretching through throughout Maryland already. Um, we have a lot of farm stands like on the Eastern shore that um, while we haven't really been able to target markets over there, um, the farmers wanna participate. They know the value of this program. They've done it um, at other markets. We actually have a lot of uh, Montgomery County markets that participate. So it's spreading. Um, as far as how the matching works, um, it works for all federal nutrition benefits, which include um, SNAP, EBT. It also, it still includes um, pandemic EBT or PEBT. Um, it includes Farmer's Market Nutrition Program or FMNP, and that's the senior part and the WIC part. Um, the major difference between those two um, is with the, so they, they're both for fruits, vegetables, and food bearing plants. Um, seniors can also purchase honey with theirs. It's like a, like a, like a voucher or a check. They literally look like checks and they're given directly to farmers. Um, unfortunately, the WIC ones do not include access to honey because of botulism. Um, it also includes eWIC at farmers markets and farm stands, 
Um, unfortunately, we're kind of like in, I don't want to call it purgatory in Maryland, but um, but we're figuring out a way forward for EWIC to be utilized at markets. So not too many markets are using that right now, but it is something that still is used like at Crossroads um, Farmer's Market. Um, also, our big news is that now we are able to offer unlimited dollar for dollar uh, benefit matching. So previous uh, previous years and um, even before this program was with SMATIC, um, it was like a $5 cap or a $10 cap. Some markets were able to offer $20. As of um, July, we're stating a unlimited dollar for dollar match. So use your snap card at the farmer's market, spend $100 get $100 in tokens. Um, so it's it's really great um, helping expand folks' food budgets. Um, something also different about our program compared to other matching programs is um, our tokens or our match can be spent on any SNAP eligible foods. So this is milk, dairy, produce, um, you know, grains, anything that you would buy at the grocery store except hot prepared food and cut flowers. So um, we really want to make sure that folks utilizing our program have autonomy to buy, um, you know, what makes sense for them and their families at, whenever they, they make their groceries. Um, benefits, right? I mean, I feel like I could go on and on and on about the benefits of this just as being a previous market manager. And then um, also now on the side of running the, the incentive program, but um, you know, it helps shoppers, it helps farmers, it helps markets, it, um, it lowers economic barriers to healthy foods. Um, it increases you know, um, farmers' uh, economic vitality. It, it, it uh, strengthens communities. It, it's just, I mean, they like to say that farmers market are third places. So they're not like, um, you know, they're not where you go to work or it's not like where you go home, but it's this third place that you can exist together as a community. And, you know, it's just good for you. So um, yeah, I mean, our program directly helps all of these people, all of you, all of our farmers, um, keeps them in the state of Maryland and our neighbors in DC and uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania. So it's, it's really good, right? <laughs> Um, as far as the numbers go, uh, we are just entering our fiscal year 23, so we have a good idea of like where we stand um, as far as like budget goes. Uh, our 20 uh, fiscal year 23 incentive budget is approximately $440,000 with potential for growth through some different GUSNIP initiatives. Um, and so if you double that, we're looking at $880,000 or more to be potentially be spent via benefits and MMM um, with local farmers markets and food producers this, this coming fiscal year. Um, that's a lot of money. I mean, and even over a billion dollars of that is spent in SNAP each year. Um, what can we do to like shift this over to farmers? So they're getting this money and then in turn, our community is being fed, they're knowing their farmers, they're, they have access to fresh local food, which tastes better, as, as more nutri uh, nutrient dense, so so many things. So um, this is kind of the background of like why we are able to lift this cap up and we're, we're just so excited to be able to share that with everyone. Um, as far as Montgomery County goes, just some, some, different, um, some different points for this. Um, we currently have these access points in place. We're working on a few others. Um, I did add one acre farm stand um, on here because that is very um, imminently coming soon in August. But um, we've got Crossroads Farmers Market, Deerwood, um, Gaithersburg, Garrett Park, Fresh Farm, Lewis Orchards Farm Stand is one of our farm stands. Um, we also now have a CSA in Montgomery County um, via Milk Lady, Milk Lady Farm Stand. Um, one acre farm stand will be coming soon in August. Uh, we have the Rockville, the Shady Grove, and the Tacoma Park Market. So lots of different places. We're always looking to add more. Another thing that we're working on is in previous years, we would always do um, like onboarding by year. Um, starting this fiscal year, we're going to start like dropping those barriers and just have a rolling process. Not only will it be easier for us to like accommodate everyone at various points instead of all at the same time, but um, you know, as we we found that with our with our applications, every market and access point is in a different a different place in their 
uh, benefit acceptance. And it's really hard to kind of fit everyone into that circle if you're square. So, um, so yeah, we'll have more news on that coming soon. But um, if you ever go to a farmer's market or visit a farmer and you're like, why don't you take this program? Have them get in touch with us because we'd love to bring them on. Um, again, we're looking to make that, that sort of like onboarding year round. So let me know. Um, some other cool things that are happening in Montgomery County, we are working on an e-incentives pilot. This is really at its beginning stages, um, but through help uh, with the Greater Washington Community Foundation and in partnership with Crossroads and Fresh Farm, we're trying to transition our um, like token economy to a digital wallet. Um, this is gonna go through my market link, also, um, in, purchase, also in collaboration with Total Pay Go. Um, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to have our e-incentives coordinator, Kelly, come on and talk to you about that whenever it gets um, rolling. But really, we're just trying to, to set, the, set the framework for that right now. But very exciting things happening in um, Montgomery County. Uh, this is the only county that we're doing this pilot in. So shout out to you guys. Um, let's see. So that's really it that I have to share with you. Oh, wait this thing over here. So I have a few different reading materials. Um, I have a Montgomery County specific flyer that's double sided. Um, if anyone is interested, we can send them to you. Uh, I have I have uh, electronic copies and I also can print them. Uh, the back side just has a list of all the materials uh, or all the um, the different grocery items that a person can like utilize their benefits to, to purchase. Um, I also have an informational rat card that um, I can send out to folks if they if they want to, you know, have them at their clinics or health centers. Um, we can send that to you guys free of charge. So please let me know. And with that, my information is here. Christina uh, Seabirthalot at somatic.com. Um, check out our website, follow us on social media. Thanks again so much, Anne-Marie, for having us here and Heather and all of you guys. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Christina, thank you so much for joining us and presenting on that. That's really exciting stuff. Um, and I hope that um, the season goes really well um, with people being able to use their benefits at market. So thank you for all you do there. Um, did anyone have any questions for Christina before we move on? I'm gonna check the chat again. I don't, oh wait, there is a question in the chat. Um, Lucia wanted to know if tokens uh, will still be available for folks who do not have smartphones and may not be able, <clears throat> excuse me, to access the mobile app. So um, with the pilot, we, are, we're, we currently have 10 markets that are gonna be implementing it and we wanna get them in some stage of implementation by the end of this year. Not, not every market's gonna move at the same speed and some like require, just, I don't want to say like hand holding, but I mean that's what it is. You have a lot of you have a lot of different farmers that are different stages of technology use and phone use, etc. Um, we have um, a backup plan for folks who farmers and shoppers who don't have access to a card um, via like a what do they call a QR. So we are we're, we are discussing different um, solutions with uh, our WIC clinic partners about like how can we. You know, does it mean getting a label maker and printing them QR code on site or like making a card in advance and assigning them? So we are working on those. We also have um, some money built into our budget to help farmers get technology. If that's something that like I really want to do this, but, you know, I don't have a hotspot. I don't have, you know, a, a, the newest mobile phone. Um, we also have are looking into translators and also um, like stipends for farmers market. So like uh, Crossroads Farmers Market, they've been able to identify, um, you know, a community member that volunteers at their market that can help with some translations for walking people through the My Market Link um, application. So we are we are keeping that in mind, not only other languages, but um, but just like uh, ability, not ability. Mm. Just everyone has a different playing field as far as like technology use goes. So we are keeping that in mind. Um, again, it's it's a pilot, so um, we're learning as we go and um, just trying to like as we come to the challenges, like how can we how can we move around this and find a solution that is uh, equal and equitable for everyone. If you have ideas, let me know. <laughs> 
Christina, there was another question in the chat. Um, could you give some examples of where farmers are accepting online SNAP in Maryland and what kinds of points of sale? Um, so online SNAP is a little different than accepting them at a farmer's market. So our, we're based, so at farmer's markets now, a lot of them you go, you slide your SNAP card and you'll get like a token. It looks like a poker chip almost. And you can turn around and spend that with the farmers. Um, we're basically just taking that and moving it to something that looks like Venmo. Um, online SNAP period is a pretty new like thing in the US in general. I know before coming here, I was in Louisiana and we didn't have any platforms where a person could use SNAP online. If I'm not mistaken, in Maryland, you can do it with Amazon and Walmart to where you can actually use your SNAP benefits online. Um, that's not something that you can currently do at farmer's markets, but we are working on that. If I'm mistaken, somebody please correct me, um, but it's just like same, same, but different. Thanks so much, Christina. There may be one or two other questions in the chat. Christina, if you could take a look and respond to those as you have a, a second, because yeah. um, I have been informed that we have now been joined by the county executive. And so I'm gonna switch things over to Heather um, to allow her to introduce that segment of our call. Thanks again so much, Christina. Yeah, thank you guys. Excellent, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to our county executive, Mark Elridge for joining us this afternoon and to so many of our colleagues um, who have hopped on to be a part of this discussion as well. I know it's summer, there's lots of demands on our time um, and I truly appreciate the county executive and our entire food security community coming together um, for this important conversation. Um, so. We have an hour uh, and lots of topics to cover. So uh, we've got a few um, ground rules that I'll, um, or some guidelines for participation that I'll go over um, in just a few moments. Uh, but we're very excited for this opportunity because we truly are at a, at a point in transition um, coming out of uh, the, the COVID response, uh, which was a time when so many different community partners stepped forward and provided critical food access services um, to our neighbors and moving towards what our long-term goals um, will be for addressing hunger in our county and how we will um, transition you know, through the cliff that's coming when a lot of the federal resources um, begin to reduce um, as well as a lot of the COVID specific local level tools um, that our community has been, been supporting, recognizing that with inflation and the persistent economic challenges, there are many, many residents who are still experiencing food insecurity, even as our public health landscape has shifted. Um, so just a, a little bit about um, you know, how we'll use our time together today. Uh, first, we'll invite the county executive to share um, a few opening remarks about his vision for the future of the county's uh, government's leadership in addressing food insecurity um, and how we'll transition from responsibility response uh, to long-term resilience building. Uh, then we'll take 40 minutes of discussion, uh, both through facilitated dialogue, as well as through some, um, some Zoom polls. And let's hope that the technology um, world is with us today to make all of this happen. Um, and then we will close with some Q&A. Thank you to those who submitted questions in advance, um, as well as um, you know additional questions as time allows and final remarks from our county executive. Um, so um, I think he may have actually been on and, and now off. Is Mr. County Executive, are you, are you here? It's a lot of Zoom boxes to get through. Okay, well, um, Maybe he had to hop off for a second. So in the meantime, I guess I will um, share a little bit about um, how we'll, we'll use our time together today and talk a little bit about the Office of Food System Resilience, uh, because I think that directly ties to um, our conversation here today, as well as the work that each of us do in Montgomery County. Uh, so as you know, the, um, the Food Security Task Force has been bringing together partners, both from the community, as well as across the county government, MCPS, uh, wide 
variety of agencies for a collaborative and strategic approach to addressing hunger in our community during that crisis. Um, while the crisis has shifted, the need for this coordinated government, um, community, public, private partnership um, persists and, and continues. And so as we look to building sustainability, equity, and resilience in our food system with a focus on strategic investments, um, grant making, and policy making, both new policies as well as enhancing existing policies, uh, the Food Security Task Force saw that the, it absolutely is essential to have a dedicated leader um, leadership within the county government to shepherd that work. Um, and so that's where the Office of Food System Resilience uh, came in as the task force is winding down uh, the county government. The county executive introduced the legislation um, through the um, County Council President Gabe Albernos um, that had a public hearing two weeks ago and actually tomorrow, uh, so on July 12th, County Council is uh, scheduled to take up the um, that legislation for a final vote, uh, creating this office with a number of permanently staffed positions to carry this work forward. Uh, and so it's a very exciting opportunity for us as um, community partners to have a dedicated um, group of partners within county government who are thinking exclusively about food and from a systems-based perspective rather than the silos of hunger or sustainability. Um, and so I think this is a really unique opportunity and I'm excited uh, to see where this government partnership takes us um, into the future. So I believe that Dr. Stoddard is actually on. Um, if the county executive had to hop off. Dr. I Stoddard. am on. I do think the CE is supposed to be on, though. I, at least, uh, he believe. had been on and then um, and then hopped off. Uh, and so I don't know if there's a what the best way to troubleshoot that would be. I'm happy to kind of talk through. I think he's checking. He uh, just walked, uh, as I understand, he just walked in the building. And so that's why he's transitioning to his his work computer. So um, you want to give him a minute or two, if that's okay. Okay. I'm, if he doesn't get I'm, on the next couple of minutes, I, I certainly can speak to it. Okay, thank you. Well, speaking of uh, champions within our county government of food systems work, uh, Dr. Earl Stratter has been an incredible leader and partner in this work um, and very grateful um, for all that he's done uh, to make sure that community is supported and connected. Um, and, uh, and we're really looking forward to your leadership and partnership as this new office is, is released. Um, in addition to the strategic planning work that's happening at the county level, there also is at the federal level, a lot of these conversations conversations happening as well. And so you may have heard through the Food Council or through other communications about a White House conference on hunger and nutrition. Um, so the last time there was a conference like this, it was during the Nixon administration, bringing together subject matter experts, government partners, community leaders, thinking about what policies are critical uh, to be able to address hunger across our country. And one of the things that came out of that was the creation of the SNAP program. So these are really big opportunities to create policies and programs um, that will help every single person um, and every single community in our country. Uh, and so the Biden administration is seeking input um, from partners across the country for input that will inform the decisions that they make in this White House conference. And so the Food Council is in part using the feedback and the insight that you will all share today to inform um, a, a letter that we will submit on behalf of the Montgomery County Food Council. Uh, we also have a conversation coming up this week with our Food Security Community Advisory Board Board, um, and we're also participating in some discussions um, for letters that will be submitted on behalf of the uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, as well as the Maryland Food System Resiliency Council. So everything that you share about your work and your knowledge will inform, I, I very much hope, the work that happens at the federal level, and they'll listen um, to the insight that is shared. Um, so I'm looking to Mark see- Mark is on. Okay, excellent. Um, hello, Mr. County Executive. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we are honored to, to have you. And I've, I've just been speaking briefly about um, how incredibly lucky we are to, to work in food security and food systems initiatives in our county, where we have um, incredible government leadership and partnership and support in moving these initiatives forward. So thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. 
Um, so we have uh, many different uh, colleagues that are that are joining us. I think um, if it's okay with you, I'll just uh, invite everybody to in the chat box. The chat box, please share your name, uh, your organization name. You may have done it already, but just um, for our special guests' benefit, so they can uh, know who is in the room with us today. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Elrich, we will start with um, a, some brief opening remarks from you about your vision for the future of food security initiatives in our county and how the government will be leading the transition from pandemic hunger crisis response to long-term food resilience. Um, and then we will have a series of polls and brief discussion sections on a variety of topics. Just asking all of my colleagues um, to please keep yourself muted. Um, when it comes time for discussion, you can use the raise hand button if you would like to speak. We're asking everyone to keep their remarks uh, brief, succinct, and one minute each. Um, and if you could please uh, begin by sharing your name and the name of your organization. If you've already spoken once and there's a number of hands up, we may call on somebody else who hasn't had the chance um, to weigh in yet. And I also encourage everybody to use the chat box to answer discussion questions or elaborate on your poll responses. And we'll be sure to capture all of the chat remarks in the notes and and as we always do, distributing thorough notes following the call. Um, and then if you have things that you wanted to share or colleagues who weren't able to join us today but have important perspectives and insights to contribute as well, we'll also be sending a follow-up form with the same poll and discussion questions to make sure all the voices have the opportunity um, to weigh in today. So um, just asking for everybody's partnerships and, um, and collaboration and making this a vibrant discussion. So. I think without further ado, uh, in inviting our, our county executive to and welcome you to the call. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I hope everybody's doing okay today. <clears throat> um, let me get this thing out of the way here. Okay. So I just want to you know, first start by thanking you all for everything that got done so far during COVID. I, I use the word so far because this thing is obviously not over. Um, we know that we're going to see another surge. We're already seeing another surge. Um, this is going to be problematic. And of course, we don't know what the next variant is. You know, I know variants four and five. Uh, I don't know what the name for the new one is, but I'm actually, what is it? B.2.175. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think we're getting used to this, but it's all, you know, a way of saying that this is going to continue to be challenging. You know, I think businesses are going to be challenged to open. People are going to be challenged to expand hours. If you don't expand hours and can't fully employ the population, then that trickles down to impacts on food. And I will say, if we don't do anything about the rising rents, um, this whole problem can disappear in the worst way possible. And I remind people that, you know, I've got, we've got tenants facing 10 to 20% rent increases right now. And if you're living in a $1,600 apartment and already spending 50 and 60% of your income on housing, and you get a 20% rent increase, that's $320, $80 a week. And all I can see is bags of food coming off the table. When I used to, when I was on the city council in Tacoma Park and we had rent stabilization, I continually reminded people that, you know, if we didn't have that program, it would literally take food out of the mouths of children. And as a school teacher, I know what that means. It is not a good outcome. So those, you know, you were in an environment where there are lots of things affecting what you're going to do, what the need is going to be that you're going to have to be addressing. We're all in this together. Um, but there was multiple different things that can impact the outcome on this. And what I always ask people is fight for the thing you're engaged with and help out on the other things. Because if you know something that we could do would help mitigate some of the effects that you're gonna see in your clients, we could really use your help trying to raise that awareness with the council when we talk about things we think we may have to do in order to protect people's housing, at least the affordability, as poor as it is, um, not make the situation any worse. The other thing I, th I think we know is we can't go back to the pre-COVID-19 situation. Uh, where community organizations were serving residents with that as much, much support as they needed. I don't think we ever had a good handle and people would always talk about the need out there, but we really, I don't think had done a good enough job of being able to put a finger on it and nor had the county ever 
committed enough resources to address it. And I think like homelessness, um, we made some decisions during the pandemic to go over and above and do things differently. And I think they're gonna to have to become a normal part of how we go forward. We're just, I mean, I don't know how you, I didn't wanna walk away from homeless people. So how we do that's gonna be really, you know, I think the major staff uh, to the county. Is that? Anne Marie, can you please make sure everybody's muted? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find. Thank you. I don't want to try to talk over that. Uh, so, you know, we told the council already the $4 million included in this year's budget is not going to be enough to cover food needs. And we're expecting to come back with it to them for additional resources. We also believe that we will be seeing some additional resources coming into the county. So I don't anticipate having to rob Peter to pay Paul. I believe that, you know, we're going to get some supplemental funds or additional funds into the budget. And so we'll actually be able to handle these things. Uh, even as we continue feeding residents, the Office of Food System Resilience will continue to coordinate the work to address the causes of food insecurity. And that goes back to the point I started with, you know, food insecurity is, is basically a wage problem. And, you know, and it's a wage and it's the cost of living. And to the extent we can have adopt policies that address those two things, that will help us address the food security issue. Uh, we also have to, you know, so I do believe we have to have better and more centralized data collection. Uh, we have to know what everybody sees so we can plan better. And we need to better understand the community need around food. And we need to get a sense of whether families are attending multiple events during the week, because uh, that would give a better indicator of how much food need there is. I mean, when I looked at the boxes that we often gave out and I went to a number of, of the food distribution efforts, um, I always wondered how people were gonna make it through a week, even with what was in the box. Um, it would have been very hard. And a lot of times there was a lack of protein, for example, uh, because some people, you know, people didn't always have access to refrigeration. So there are a lot of things that I saw as, you know, th things I would hope we could increase and improve on and that's part of the work we're going to have to do. Uh, we're going to have to deal with um, how we get people to these centers. It's one reason why, you know, I worked with my staff to maintain as many of the centers as we can maintain, because coming to just the county's hubs was a real problem for some people. And I know that, you know, like in, in my neighborhood, small things matters, serves a community that's not terribly mobile. And, uh, having that available at the neighborhood level was really, really important for being able to reach people. So I wanna make sure that we can keep doing things like that. Uh, do we need to look at what we can do to provide drivers um, to get access to food? Or do you, conversely, do you, can you do delivery instead of drivers? And we need to learn from our community from um, more about the enrollment than the free and reduced meals program in MCPS. And we need to have a conversation with MCPS about actually getting, encouraging parents to sign up for more of the food benefits because we way undersubscribe in some of, some of these areas. We know the number of people signing up don't match the number of people who could sign up. And we really need MCPS's support in getting that information to parents so the parents can uh, fill out the forms we need. And I'm going to continue to support the expansion of our consolidated hubs. I know on the East County, we're looking at major refrigeration. We'll be able to put in something so that people could actually take meat or, you know, chickens or whatever they're given and be able to either store it cold or store it frozen so that food's available and they don't have to throw it away. Or, if, you know, if they don't get rid of everything and they have no place to store it overnight, they have to, you know, mostly it just wounds up wound up not getting used. So we've got to make sure we can put additional facilities in place and probably look at that in a couple of other places in the county. I don't know what the storage needs are in the up county or if everybody has it, but my guess is everybody does not have adequate storage. So we may need to look at a couple rather than just one storage facility in the county. And we need, like I said, get residents enrolled in as many of the eligible programs that we can get them enrolled in. That, by the way, that also includes talking to residents about enrolling in rent relief. You know, that's another place that we can uh, use some help. We're hoping that some more money comes into that program as well 
um, but we've been very limited. You know, we basically have served people at 50% of very median income and lower, not because we were being mean, but we thought those were the households that would have the toughest time recovering. And we didn't have uh, the means to support everybody who lost you know, their jobs and weren't able to pay rent. And so uh, people played Solomon, not a job I particularly like, um, deciding who gets and who doesn't get. Um, but hopefully at some point we'll see more resources coming into that program. And I think we need to make better use for agricultural reserve. Um, it, it grows a lot of things that in, in, in ways certainly wind up back in, back in the food system. You know, our farmers who grow um, soybeans or who grow field corn are providing that corn to farmers who feed cattle and that cattle then winds up in our markets. But we could use um, more locally producing table crops in the ag reserve. Um, and I frankly, I'm somebody who's come around to thinking actually more either greenhouses or hoop houses in the ag reserve so we could extend the growing seasons here. And so we wanna make sure that we're working with our farmers uh, to talk more about what they can do to extend growing seasons. And it's, I think the big issue with um, farm to market, whether it's individuals or whether it's grocery stores, is linking up farmers to consumers, individual or restaurants or stores. And so they can tie what they're growing to demand from the stores. In other words, like you sign up for, um, for a food program from somebody and you know you get you get your pickup every week. Um, we need farmers to know that a grocery store would like to see certain crops during these months of the year, and find local farmers who can provide those crops for a grocery store. So that's one way of you know moving people out of um, the big row crops and into food crops that would be more use at the local level. Uh, I'm also intrigued by the. Um, the food stores that have been stood up, the choice, I guess it's called choice pantries. Um, you know, objectively, that seems like an even better way of providing things to people. It's, it's gonna, it would take a little longer to run through the lines of people because you don't have the pre, you know, predetermined boxes. On the other hand, that offers, there's, I think, a greater measure of dignity and self-determination to people who can go into a store and take something off the shelf and say, this is what I want. Uh, rather than this is what's in your box. And we need to think about ways to do that because obviously it requires um, it requires some additional facilities. And, you know, first thing that came to my mind is if we're doing this on parking lots and the parking lots are never full, could you stand up, you know, a double wide trailer and turn the inside of that trailer into a small store and use that store to let people come in and do their own shopping? Uh, whatever, there are ways we can do this. And I'm very much interested in promoting more of that and uh, very interested in improving the nutritional value and choice in food products. And I would extend that to the school system because I was a former teacher and I was usually appalled by what was fed to the kids in school and uh, too much sugar, too many carbs, uh, kind of high calorie, high energy, but low quality food and uh, we can do better and other jurisdictions have done better and we need to work with the school system to engage them in beginning to transform our feeding practices to healthier feeding practices. I think that would go a long way to help. And um, I'll just close by saying, I'm really happy to be doing this work with you. I'm glad we're setting up the Office of Food Resilience. Um, I'm optimistic about where we can go with this because I know everybody here is motivated and uh, I like the model you've created. I like the fact that there are so many people engaged at the small local level. It you know, makes it a little harder sometimes to distribute things from us to that level. But on the other hand, it makes it easier to get the food into the community. And at the end of the day, this is all about food going into the community where it's needed, not what's the most convenient way to distrib distribute food. So I'll continue to work with you to make sure we uh, have a deep touch in the community as possible. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you all for what you're doing and hang around for a little while until I get dragged to our next meeting. 
Thank you very much. Well, um, so many of the elements that you've touched on, we're hoping to discuss with this um, group of uh, food security experts today around data, operations models, demand case management. So I hope we'll have a chance um, to hear from our community partners so that they can um, you know, share what they're seeing in their direct services in the community and so much to be excited about in your remarks. So thank you um, in addition to uh, for your passion on the subject for the investments that the county is making in the FY23 budget around food. Uh, there's a lot to celebrate in addition to the Office of Food System Resilience and dedicated staffing for the work that's needed to pull together all of these, um, you know, the make the vision a reality, uh, but also the Farm to Food Bank program, community farm share, the gardening grants, um, over $4 million for bulk food purchasing. So um, so lots of resources um, to start to move some of the systems-based work forward. So thank you again uh, mm -hmm. for your championship of this work. Um, so to get us started, we are going to have two polls um, that will come up just so we can get a sense both of who's in the room. Um, and then also, um, I think, starting off some some uh, questions around um, around your work in the community. So I think Elizabeth is going to make that live, and there's the there's the opening poll. Um, so and we're going to do these lightning round. Uh, so just go with your gut and your initial reaction. We'll leave it up for about five seconds, and then Elizabeth will share the responses um, just to give us a sense of how many of you are directly distributing food um, and. Um, how long you've been in operations, because we have some organizations that it's been many, many years and some that have been um, pretty new to this space. So, um, so if everybody can just take one more second. And then Elizabeth, maybe you can do a countdown. <laughs> Sorry, too late. I cut everyone off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, and what were your, uh, could you share the results? Excellent, okay. So that's incredible. And a call with over a hundred people, um, over 85% of the participants are engaged in food security work. Um, and it looks like a wide range of, um, of dates, which I think really is highlights the, the diversity of our food security system right now. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. And then the next poll is about our first area of discussion. And I'm gonna put in the chat box as you're answering the poll, um, some of the, the questions that we were hoping our food security partners can address. Um, so Elizabeth is pulling up the poll. I'll just read the discussion questions, um, which are also in the chat box. Really looking at demand for services. Um, what are the factors that you're hearing about from participants that are impacting demand for services? Specific populations where you're seeing increases, decreases in demand. Um, is your organization able to meet the, the current level of demand? And other than food to distribute, what other resources are in significant demand right now? So again, um, just asking everybody to take just five seconds to answer. Elizabeth will show us the results. And then um, if you would like to comment on this discussion area, any of the questions that have been posed, you can push the raise hand button and you can reach that uh, by going to the reactions tab, click on that and then click raise hand and that will help us know who would like to weigh in. All right. and. I think Elizabeth has wrapped up the poll. And what are, all right. So we've got over 72% either seeing significant or slight increases in demand for services. Um, about 20% stayed the same. And, um, and if you indicated other, if you don't mind sharing um, what other means, that would be really helpful. So um, I guess the first question would be if you wanna share with the county executive and your colleagues, what are some of the factors that are impacting resident demand for services? What are some of the stories that you're hearing? Um, and you can just click the raised hand button. It's always tough to be the first person to jump in, but I'm sure somebody has, um, has a perspective to share. Judy. Yeah. Judy Clark? Or Yes, yeah. I don't know if you can hear me or see me. Yeah. Um, Thanks everybody, glad to be on this call. Thank you, Mark and everybody else for being here. Um, our impact um, 
we focus primarily on child hunger feeding kids and the impact right now is very, very significant. And this is largely due to the, um, the waiver, the, the fact that USDA is not getting all of this extra food to Montgomery County Public Schools. So it's putting even a greater demand on our program, almost like during the height of COVID. During the height of COVID, um, we were feeding upwards of 7,000 um, kids each week with the weekend meals. And although it's not that high yet, um, there's a lot of um, children that we're feeding, not just in the summer schools, in the schools that have summer school, but just in the community as, at large. And so that great impact, that significant increase is due to the fact that the waiver for free meals has been lifted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy, for all you do to support the kids. Doreen. Hi, and thank you, uh, Mark, for being here. Well, our, um, our increase, most of the stories we're hearing, is a result of the gas prices. We are in Ashton, and a lot of our people would drive out to pick up food, and we do it every two weeks. Well, now people are coming once a month because it's just too expensive to keep coming back. And the requests for deliveries are, are getting higher, but then we have a shortage of drivers. So I think what I hear most is the, the, the effect it has on the household, the cost of gas. Thank you so much, Doreen. And I'm seeing this from um, colleagues in the chat box as well, the cost of food, supplies, fuel for transportation. Um, so that's impacting both service and operational costs as well as um, the demand from the communities. Um, Manny's talking about the increased cost of living just in general. Um, and uh, Pat Drumming is noting an increased need for more child-friendly foods, uh, especially with, with schools out. Any additional comments before we move on? I also wanna just note, do you have the resources that you need uh, to meet the demand? I see Ken Flemmer. Sorry. Um, I haven't done a survey, but in general, you can move things a little bit. Top of the list, diapers, then food, hygiene, and feminine hygiene. Those things are in great demand and highly, highly valued. Yes, thank you, Ken. And any, um, and just seeing some additional support. Um, Lucia, do you wanna speak about seniors? Not to put you on the spot. No, no problem. So I've been here from some seniors that are, and these are immigrant seniors that are trying to get their um, unemployment benefits and a lot of applications have been denied. Maybe they're not filling them out correctly, um, but this is causing a lot of strain in some households uh, where they have to go to, um, to the food distributions to pick up foods. And the same thing with SNAP's um, benefits. It's just the, the, the amount of paperwork and the uh, hoops that they have to jump is really hard. Thank you for sharing that, Lucia. Dr. Choti? Um, thank you, Heather. Um, Trufena Chote from AgriTrive. What we're seeing, of course, the food prices are really driving people to our food distributions. But I'm thinking also um, what we have seen lately are people asking because we provide the produce, but people are asking for other like the grains, rice and beans. They are looking for flour to go and cook. So we are seeing those numbers growing and we have seen the seniors, especially because we distribute in the Aspen Hill where their senior living facility, we're seeing a great number of seniors coming out. So I think our help will be really uh, be appreciated. And thank you uh, for coming to listen to all these people who are really interacting every day. Families are hurting and any help uh, that's available could really go a long way for these families. Thank you. Thank you so much. And some really great suggestions in the and comments in the chat box as well. Appreciate the somebody, uh, Melissa holding up, there's a you know, a nationwide shortage of feminine hygiene products. And so that's driving demand up um, at community sites. There's a new partnership with community schools and the Maryland Diaper Bank. Um, so I don't know, Sherry, if there's a way to note 
how others, um, you know, can refer residents to access those services or if they're just for um, community school partners specifically. But um, I appreciate Pat, did you want to share about the um, some of the demands that you're seeing in East County, Pat Drumming? I know she put something oh. in the chat box. Oh, wow. Sure. Thank you so much. Appreciate everything. Appreciate all the help and especially, you know, the allocations of funds so that we can have resources to make sure that no one's food insecure. For us, we're seeing a lot more requests for the personal hygiene items and the household cleaners and, you know, your toilet paper, those basics, et cetera. And interestingly, for some reason, the past couple months, a lot more requests for adult diapers. Um, and I think a lot of that the other, I don't know about the adult diapers, what's driving that, but lots of requests for diapers is the heavy immigrant population. Um, you know, there's a lot of more immigrants that have been brought into the White Oak area, particularly um, we have a lot of Afghan refugees here and um, they are really asking. And, and I, I felt like we missed an opportunity when we were at the Enclave because we actually had Montgomery Works or one of those groups there, but they didn't know to go to the table. So there had to be a way because it was at the end. So many of them were saying, we can't get a job. Can you please help us get a job? We need a job. We want to work. And we saw uh, quite a few of the kids there um, when we were asking, where are your parents? Because they were small kids and the ones that were able to work, <laughs> they were at work, but the kids were there with no one looking after them. So we are, you know, uh, looking to think of ways that we can do more in that community to make sure that kids are have all the food they need and that they're active. We could tell they were really hungry because even some of the larger containers of milk that were given out, you know, the shelf stable square boxes, those were literally ripped apart and all over the parking lot. You could see that they had eaten, you know, apples and fruit. So we knew that they were um, in need of food and, and, you know, we were glad to do it. We just didn't have enough people to handle the crowds in the way that we would have liked to. So just trying to figure how we can um, get the food that they need, but connect them in, in the, so that when, when someone's there at our booths, that they aren't just at the booths, that they're actually out there talking to the residents. And one of the areas we discovered, even on Siri, I couldn't even translate. I rely on Siri for a lot of my populations, but it said it couldn't even translate into the Persian or the Farsi language. So that was interesting. Thank you so much, Pat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I'm seeing some comments as well about how, as we talked about before, transition and challenges in some of the federal resources. I appreciate Christina's talking about challenges with TFAP. I know Rona noted that the emergency allotments through SNAP is going to end very soon, and that's going to make a massive impact on so many households. Um, resources for, for buying groceries every month. Um, note, somebody noted fewer farmers market donations. Um, Dr. Cissé noted a higher demand for um, culturally diverse um, food for, for distribution and some questions about transportation tools too. So um, really valuable information. Thank you all for sharing. And not to shut, cut short that piece of the conversation, but I do want to move on to um, hearing a little bit more about how you all are working together. I think we see this so often in our um, discussions um, and these food security community calls about how you're informally and formally partnering with each other, um, but would love to hear a little bit more about that and share that with the county executive as well. Um, so Elizabeth has a poll with two quick questions about how regularly you're partnering with other organizations and how many organizations you partner with. And then once Elizabeth shares those findings, um, then we will get into a few additional discussion questions. Ms. Relrich, anything you would um, add as a question or comment before we transition to the, to the discussion of collaboration? <laughs> I'll listen to the discussion on collaboration. <laughs> okay, great. Because I'm not on the ground, you know, I, you know, I know philosophically what everybody's trying to do, but your experiences are the relevant ones, not my hopes and dreams or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, unsurprisingly, we have uh, a lot of partnership happening often. Um, so we've got over 80% of the organizations regularly partnering um, with a wide range, over 15% um, partnering with over 20 organizations, which I think is pretty, pretty incredible. So thank you all for, for sharing 
your feedback there um, and some chat, uh, some questions in the chat. Um, would love to know about what partnerships help you accomplish in your own programs and services and what are the types of resources that you share and so it may be commonplace to you but i think this is a good um time to highlight um you know what are some of the the, the tools and resources that you share and also what tools and resources do you need to better partner um with each other and Anne marie i think i'm gonna turn it over to you for facilitation of this section and i see carla has her hand up Great, Carla. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, one of the ways that we partner is we have um, calls that, for example, I have a connection with 27 Pizza Huts. And so what we do is we, I don't pick up from all of the Pizza Huts. I share that opportunity with different um, food distributions, we also come together to um, partner to be better, get better um, buying power. We, um, another way we do it is say if we have a food distribution on Tuesday and they have extra stuff, then we find out who the person who may be having one on Wednesday and we share our leftovers with, with them. And then we also ask everyone who partners together, if you can get eggs, then get the most amount of eggs you can get because you may only need 50 eggs, but the people that are in our circle, we can share it amongst each other. So that's the ways that how we collaborate and partner. Okay, Agar. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, so we have a partnership with local stores in our voucher program. We are working right now with uh, four local stores to connect people who uh, with their culturally appropriate food. And we, in that same program, we are partnering with community-based organizations. Uh, we have, um, I think, four right now in that small program. And we also work with uh, older community-based organizations like uh, Black Physician uh, Healthcare Network to, when they do the uh, diaper distribution, we also do food distribution so that we can connect people with uh, diverse uh, resources. We partner with um, the African Health Program and other many other uh, community groups uh, to provide many resources to people in the community. So uh, yes, we, we collaborate with um, a lot of folks in the community to serve our members. Thanks, Agar. Cheryl? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanted to let you all know about MANA. MANA's Community Food Rescue Program, we partner in two different ways. First, for recovered food, we have a network of over 100 food assistance providers in the network, so we can share recovered food that um, we are recovering from food businesses of all kinds in Montgomery County. And the other program is that uh, MANA also administers the Farm to Food Bank program. So this is where, thanks to county funding and funding through um, private foundations, we are able to purchase locally produced and harvested food and then share that again through the Community Food Rescue Network um, of over 100 agencies. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Stephanie Paraiso? Everyone, good afternoon, Mr. Eldridge. Um, on behalf of um, some of the hubs, um, we work together. Um, if we have extra things, we kind of share information. We also work within um, our groups as well to partner with smaller organizations and also find out um, what other entities will be open to give donations and things like that as well. So we've shared information like, you know, Target or Amazon Fresh and things like that. So we we partner with 
each other in that regard, or if someone's closest to our zip code, there is a zip code organization chart that we have so that even if we are able to supply food to someone, instead of them having to drive all the way to our specific hub, if there's a hub closest to them, we give them that information and then we also communicate with the other hub. So we're, we've started a collaborative effort that way so that we're, we're maximizing our reach, but then also helping each other and other smaller organizations to be able to serve and kind of limit the um, food insecurity and social services as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we have uh, a little bit of time for just one more quick response. I'm gonna say Dr. Sese. Yeah, well, I just want to say a little bit about like for the East County, um, we do collaborate and do host some programs together. We, but drumming, you know, sometimes we share with us <laughs> and share with the other part of the group and we're planning our expo, which we hosted last year and invite county organizations come over and speak and distribute their resources. And we're planning it for the 28th of August this year again. So that's part of our partnership and collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Sese. That was super quick. So I'm gonna move on also time for Roxanne, please. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to um, mention that we, get, we have a lot of different partnerships in place. Um, we partner with I Support the Girls to get feminine hygiene products. We partner with other nonprofits such as Silver Spring Cares to get um, hot meals donated. Um, we also reach out a lot to children in the community. We have this great resource for SSL hours so people can come out to earn, S you know, children can come out to earn SSL hours with us to serve because we're short on volunteers. And also they can make things for SSL hours. So we get a lot of food donated by them and we use that to feed our families. The other thing that we have a great collaboration in is that in Tacoma Park, there are now four community pantries and there are these great individuals that have set up um, places outside their homes where they've got either refrigerators or coolers or just bins where they can store food safely and that uh, we can deliver food to, and they have families that can come there and get food without, you know, the some problems of stigma or language or things that might, or transportation, because all of these things are within walking distances of their homes. And I think um, establishing more of these in, in all the community neighborhoods would be really helpful to the people and would help them serve, help us serve locally. And it's also a great place for us, whenever we have excess food from our larger distributions, we can, um, go and distribute at these places and they reach out to all of their families and we know that none of the food goes to waste. So um, I just wanted to mention some of these things. Thank you. And also thank you to the county executive for all of his help and you know for coming out and he's actually been to some of these um, community pantries and seen how it works and it's it's really he's supported so many great things and given us all so many great opportunities to help people. So really grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Roxanne. Can I say something? Sure, please. I just, you know, I always appreciate getting that kind of compliment, but I got to say my job is the easy end of this, really. You know, we distribute funds and, you know, we, we help, but you all do this work every day. I mean, I, I've seen you know, the work you put into, you know, getting food ready or, you know, all, all of the things that you have to do in order to make your thing function. So if you weren't doing this, we wouldn't be doing it. And I just want you to know, I, I get this relationship. So credit is good, but credit, you know, the bulk of the credit for making it happen rests with you all. And I just want you to know, I, I recognize that. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to run our next poll on case management and data collection. And so this is asking what other resources does your organization routinely refer clients to as part of your regular services? And what data does your organization collect on participation? 
I'll give that just a minute. Elizabeth, you can let me know when you've stopped. <laughs> And in the meantime, I'm going to add our discussion questions in the chat. And I apologize with the way I'm logged in. I cannot see um, the results from the poll. So Heather, if there's something you wanted to be sure to point out, please feel free to, to speak up. That's Elizabeth who will share the findings. <laughs> okay, great. We got a slow start on this one. I'm just, just okay. More. No worries. <laughs> All right, five seconds, folks. And in the meantime, I'd love for everybody to take a look at the questions in the chat box because management, I think, is a key piece of work moving forward. So, what does case management look like in your organization? Do you provide services other than food distribution? Is this a new aspect of your model or something you have been doing for a long time? If you don't do case management, is it something you are considering pursuing? And if so, what resources will you need to do so? How do you partner with county agencies in referring residents to services? Oh, I've stopped. Did you want me to share them again? Are you that would be great. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think it underscores really how many people we've got Anne Marie that um, over 70% are referring to SNAPWIC and other benefits programs. Um, oh, more than two thirds are referring to other food assistance providers and more than three quarters are collecting a variety of data. Uh, I think it would be really helpful for us to hear from all of you on what's working related to data collection and reporting, what's challenging, uh, because I know that that is something that is often an expectation, but not necessarily resourced through funds or, or other um, resources that you need. Um, so it would be really helpful to know from all of you what would make this case management and data collection and reporting easier. And just because I don't see any hands up as of yet, um, Sherry, if you wanted to share your comment um, from the chat or if there's anything more you wanted to say, feel free. I think I'm the only Sherry, not sure. Hi, Heather, how are you today? Um, thanks to everyone for the work that they're doing. I would say as one of the, um, as one of the county hubs that we have a partnership with Catholic Charities, but for case managers, managers. And they really are the glue to being able to provide consolidated services and help us to really try to find out exactly what the needs um, are for people coming and to help to meet those needs past just being able to give out food or diapers or those immediate needs, but to help them to have long-term um, long sustainability. So, um, it would really be great. We, um, we don't have enough case managers to really just serve each hub. So there's like a, a backlog with the case managers um, trying to meet the needs because all of the hubs are serving, you know, over like 500 people at this time. So they have one case manager at three hubs. It's really challenging. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Marco? Hello. You actually get Grace and, uh, and Stephanie, who's our case manager. Uh, and I'm going to just have Stephanie share, um, since, since she does the actual work, I would like her to share some of it with, uh, with our county executive and also some of the barriers that we are facing. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Rodriguez. I'm the case manager here at the Elk County Hub. Um, uh, as one of the questions that were asked in regards to the increase of SNAP uh, requests, it has gone um, higher within the last two or three days. I've probably received about 20 referrals and that's just requesting just for more food, help either in food itself, deliveries and SNAP applications. And just today I've received someone that didn't even know 
about the SNAP application. So then, you know, again, it's more of outreach and also just the process itself. Um, not only that, but the difficulties that I've experienced is more of everything's technology. Um, sometimes it just shuts me off and I can't even go back on to help the person or client uh, finish their application. It's more the contact, um, the timing of getting in contact with them with regards to their actual application status, um, messages or correspondence sent to their homes. Um, what else? And also, you know, the access of finding someone to be able to help them. And as long as, you know, they know of us, that's, you know, they're lucky, but if they don't, they don't know of any place that they can go to. Yeah, and and um, and one of the big barriers right now, and maybe um, other folks on this call um, might feel the same way, is the fact that we have gone totally doing stuff online, which I think technology is great, but for a lot of our families who, uh, as Mark expressed earlier, you know, who might not have broadband, who might not have access to a computer, who don't even have an email, one of the things that we encounter quite a bit is when we actually have moms who come in who have helped other moms, but now they need the help. They have actually used their email. So now they have to create a new email so they can help themselves because you can only have that email once. So we see that a lot. Um, when it comes to access, we are, you know, we are located in the Up County Regional Center. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of the folks who go to the second floor. Unfortunately, they don't get the support and the help they should be getting um, in filling out these forms. And um, as some of the data shows, we see that we have uh, so many kids receiving forms, but a lot less, a uh, lot, lot less of those kids are receiving SNAP by the thousands. So we know we're not reaching out to, you know, the community. So it would be great to have a better coordination between MCPS and some of the other, the other folks who are providing some of this, some of these organizations, because um, if we know, you know, we, we have 40 some thousand kids receiving reduced lunch, but we know we only have 30 some thousand receiving SNAP. So we know where the discrepancies are. So we know who these kids are. So we can actually do very specific targeting to ensure that they're filling out the SNAP forms. Um, but those are quite a few of the, of the barriers. We're, we're happy to do it, but um, Stephanie's actually, um, her, her position is actually um, because of a grant that we did with the Greater Washington um, Foundation. So we're hoping that we're gonna be able to, you know, we wanna make sure we keep Stephanie because she's probably the busiest, one of the busiest person that we have. Because now we're also helping folks with the farm, um, the farm applications as well. Thank you. Thank you, Grace and Stephanie. Um, County Executive, do you have time? I wanna be mindful of your time, it's 2.28. Um, do you want to do, we have one other question topic lined up, or we can move to closing remarks, um, whichever works best for your schedule. So let me take a quick look at my schedule. I try not to look at my schedule too far in advance because it gets scary. Um, <laughs> I'm supposed to meet some people here at 2.30. I don't see them here yet. Harriet? Oops. Okay. I don't see him here yet. I can stay on for a few more minutes. Okay. Why don't we move to closing remarks then? It's, it sounds like I don't, I don't want to keep anyone else waiting. We want to be respectful of their time too. So thank you. So Anne-Marie, do you want to do the poll and then we could do closing remarks maybe just uh, does that sound sure. okay? Sure. Elizabeth, if you wanted to, this was our last question and we can still collect information um, later on in a, a follow-up poll with our audience. Um, this is about operational strategies. So where do you source food for distribution? And what is your distribution model? So we'd love to collect that information. And like I said, any um, questions relating to that, we will share after this call and are still happy to take everyone's feedback on.
And then just while everybody's voting um, on behalf of the Food Council team and our whole food security community, um, thank you so much, Mr. Elrich, for joining us today, Dr. Stoddard, and, um, and all of your many hardworking colleagues in, in county government. Um, so thank you for taking the time. And I can only imagine how scary that calendar is. Um, and so thank you for sharing um, an hour of it with, with all of us. Uh, so um, I think if Elizabeth has the final results and then we'll um, and then we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Elrich, for your closing thoughts. Okay. And I know Anne Marie can't see it, uh, but it is a very diverse uh, sourcing mechanism and strategy that all of our um, partners use um, with food recovery, community donations, donations from other providers, the bulk food purchasing program, all participate, all. Um, mechanisms of over 50 or 50% 50 of our participants and lots of diverse distribution models um, as well with home delivery seeming to be the largest um, response with 68% offering home delivery. So lots of really great data here. Um, thanks for everybody for weighing in. And again, we'll be following up with the final, with the poll so that you can um, share any additional comments you have here. And so without further um, hesitation, thank you again, Mr. Elrich for being with us and the final words are yours. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very optimistic about our ability to, you know, more deeply manage this problem. I think, um, I think all of us have recognized that uh, that a re response during COVID was nice, but a more permanent response and a recognition of this problem and some other problems in this community is being long lasting will help people shift their thinking about this. Um, you know, this, all these things are ultimately become subjects of budgets, um, but how they get talked about and how the community um, weighs their importance is a big deal in terms of how they get, get treated in budgets. So I'm optimistic that as we continue to do this work, and you know, particularly you know, what you're doing in the community, that people will recognize the real value that it brings here. And hopefully, like I said earlier, I hope we can, you know, coalesce around some other issues that are external to feeding people because they all impact whether they're going to be able to, to really survive here. Um, and I, I know that you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't care about the long term outcomes for these members of our community. So I think there's a lot of work we can do together. And I look forward to doing that with you. Um, and I, you know, there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon, so let's take advantage of it. I couldn't agree more. Um, so thanks again for your leadership and partnership and to all of our many, many uh, community friends who are on the call today, looking forward to our work together collectively in, um, in moving forward. So thank you again so much for your time to everybody who joined us, to Anne-Marie and the Food Council team for all of your hard work behind the scenes, making this possible. And I'll look forward to, to staying connected with, with all of you as, as summer marches on. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Everybody have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you on our week. August call. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Marla.